So the most commonly used methods in personality research are self-reports, informant reports, behavior, and life outcomes. So self-reports are basically what they sound like. People fill out a questionnaire about their own personality, um, and we take that pretty much at face value. We assume that you're an expert on yourself, that you know a lot about your own personality. Um, informant reports are reports by people who know you. Um, so these are commonly like your close friends, your family, maybe people you work with, your boss, um, but they can be anybody really. So it could be that we bring people to the lab and have them get to know each other and then have them fill out informant reports on each other. So there's a, a whole wide range of informant reports, um, everything from relationship partners and parents to new friends or roommates or teammates or coworkers. Behavioral measures are pretty common in personality research, and those are really um, hard to implement because you really want to directly track people's behavior. So we're not asking them to self-report on their behavior. We're not asking their friends how they behave, but we're actually trying to directly measure how people behave. And that can be in the lab or outside the lab. So in the lab, we might bring people in and put them in a situation where they have to cooperate with somebody or play a game or um, solve a difficult task with other people. And then we videotape their behavior and we literally code how many times did they interrupt others? How much did they talk? Did they compliment other people? Did they offer to help? And then we also do the same thing outside of the lab, which can be even trickier. Um, so there what we do is we, um, one, one common method or relatively common is called the electronically activated recorder. And it's really just an app that we put on an iPod touch and we have people carry it around where they clip it to the outside of their clothes or their book bag or something they're carrying. Um, and it has a program on it that turns the audio recorder on and off at, at intervals and then we use those audio recordings to code what people were doing. So how much were they socializing? How much were they working? How much were they watching TV? What kinds of words did they use when they were talking? What kinds of conversation topics did they engage in? Things like that. So that allows us to m directly measure their behavior in their real world, li their everyday lives, their real world environments. And then the last method is life outcomes. So that's where we look at records like, have they been married, divorced? How many times have they been to the hospital? Um, their arrest record, their um, salary or tax records, if that's available. Some of those are publicly available and some of those you would need people to consent to showing those to you. And there's a lot of kind of traces of personality you can find in those kinds of life outcome measures. So the advantages and disadvantages um, with self-reports, it's kind of what you would expect. The advantage is that you are probably one of the best experts on yourself. You're the only person who has the opportunity to see yourself in every situation. You know, you know what you're like when you're with your family. You know what you're like when you're with your friends. You know what you're like when you're alone, when you're stressed out, when you're relaxed, etc. Um, so you potentially have all of that information about yourself and you, ha you, you have the most... Um, access to all of your behaviors and thoughts and feelings, at least potentially, right? How much you're actually paying attention, how accurate you really are is another question, but you have potential access to lots and lots of information about yourself over your whole lifespan across many situations. Um, so one of the main advantages is just the sheer amount of information that you have about yourself and also your, your access to your thoughts and feelings, because part of your personality is your typical pattern of thinking and feeling in addition to your behavior. And really you have the most direct access to your thoughts and feelings. So you have a lot of kind of expert privileged information. So that's one of the big advantages of self-reports. The main disadvantage is that people might not always be self-aware or honest. So especially in high stakes testing situations, if we want to know someone's personality because we want to decide whether to put them on a space shuttle or something like that, right? People might be pretty motivated to want to come across in a positive way or want to tell you what you want to hear. And so if we have reasons to worry about people's honesty or even just their ability to be aware of the personality traits that we're interested in, then we might not want to rely so much on self-reports. So if I really want to know, I'm not that interested in your thoughts and feelings. I really want to know how you typically behave around other people. You might not be your be the best expert on that because you're more in your head. So informants who see you from an outsider's perspective might actually be more accurate about that. So the advantages and disadvantages of informant reports are often kind of the flip of the advantages and disadvantages of self-reports. So informants are less in your head, so that means they have less access to your thoughts and feelings, 
Although some informants, like people you live with, might have actually pretty good information about your thoughts and feelings, but your friends or your teammates, your coworkers probably don't have a ton of insight into your thoughts and feelings, but they are quite objective about your behavior. On the other hand, they have limited awareness of you across different contexts. So many informants only see you in one or a few contexts and they don't know what you're like, for example, with your family or when you're alone. So there's, that's one downside of informant reports. Another advantage of informant reports, though, is that you can aggregate across many different informants. So if I want to know what you're like in a lot of different contexts, I can ask informants who know you in those different contexts and kind of average their ratings or even look at the discrepancy between their ratings. And that can give me a lot of insight into what you're like in those different contexts. One of the main advantages of behavioral measures of personality is that they seem objective. And I say seem because, and that's an advantage because uh, a lot of people feel like that's that's just the getting at the core of who you are is how you actually behave, not how you say you behave, not how other people, not how other people say you behave, but what you actually do in your everyday life. On the other hand, um, even though it seems like we could get at this direct pipeline to your behavior by recording your behavior and just coding it, it's actually not that simple. In my own work, we use behavioral measures a lot. And so we have these audio recordings and then we have members of our research team listen to the audio recordings and code behavior. And what we find is there's still a lot of judgment calls that we have to make. So we hear something, was it someone bragging or was it, were they not bragging? It kind of depends on the context and we can hear a little bit of context before and after, but sometimes we're missing stuff because we only have the audio. So a lot of times behavior is not as clear cut as we think it is. And even with, um, in some of the research on animal personality, non-human animals, you would think behavior there is clear cut right there. Either the chimpanzee is running away from another chimpanzee or it's not. But then you get in situations where you're like, well, it's kind of half-heartedly running away. Do we count that as running away or not? It turns out that even behavior coding has a lot of gray areas. So it's not quite as objective as it seems, but it does have kind of this objectivity in the sense that it's not influenced by the biases that people have about themselves or about their friends because the coders coding the behavior are not emotionally invested and they don't have a relationship with the person they're coding. They're members of the research team doing the coding. And one disadvantage of behavioral measures of personality is that there's not a clear one-to-one -one relationship between a behavior and a personality trait. So if I want to know how to measure extroversion with behavior, I have to reason through what would be the behavioral manifestations of extroversion. And I have to rely on theory and just logic and reasoning, and I have to justify my decisions. Whereas with questionnaire measures like self and informant reports, I can directly ask about the traits I'm interested in. So I know if I know extroversion is socializing and being dominant, being assertive and being exuberant and enthusiastic, I can just ask about those traits in a questionnaire. But to translate them to behavior requires, again, a judgment call. So I might say, okay, if I I want to measure extroversion with behavior, I'm going to look at how much the person talks, how loudly they talk, how many different people they talk to, um, and other characteristics of their interpersonal behavior, but I still have to come up with those what those behaviors exactly are. And there's always going to be some gap between the behavior and the personality trait. So even though talking is quite a good indicator of extroversion, for example, I'm an introvert. Right now I'm talking quite a bit because I'm doing a video on personality or when I'm teaching, I talk a lot more than I usually do. So if somebody just watched my behavior during that hour, they might have a hard time telling that I'm introverted. Although research actually shows that even when you put an introvert in a situation where they have to be extroverted, you can still tell. So there's still other subtle cues. Um, even people watching this video actually probably would have guessed that I'm more introverted than extroverted, even though because of the role I'm in right now, I'm talking a lot. Um, the life outcomes has some of the same advantages and disadvantages as behavior in that it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. So for example, um, if you wanna look at how much money somebody makes, what, what personality trait is that supposed to reflect? So it might reflect um, conscientiousness, working hard and being self-disciplined and having self-control. It might reflect disagreeableness, being willing to negotiate hard and kind of um, co confront people that might lead to a higher salary. So it's always there's always some guesswork or some um, ambiguity in how to interpret life outcome data and map it on to personality.